Right, we'll get started. Um, welcome to this Friday's Angel Open Curation Call. My name is Munish Jakhani, and I'm clinical lead with the NHS Digital for Fire Curation and Integration Projects. I'm going to chair this call. You're all muted on entry. This is an interactive session, so as the presenters I talk about um, the content, please feel free to raise your hand. If you have any question, I'll bring you in and please unmute yourself and I can ask you a question. You can also put your question and comments in the chat window, which I'll be monitoring. This um, WebEx is being recorded and we'll, we'll share the recording on RIVA later on. The presentation is already published on RIVA. And once again, the purpose of this call is to talk about pathology and test results and the fire design for those uh, from the perspective of three programs, the CCI07 pathology program, the GP to GP, and GP Connect. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Pete Salisbury. Morning. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? So, yes, we can hear you. Good. Um, So um, I'll be going through a bit of background, so a little bit about the programs uh, that we're developing for or developing the models for, uh, and then we'll be talking through some of the key discussion points, so what resources we're going to use, um, the various options where we need to pick a, a certain option, and there are, there's more than one way of doing it, uh, particularly test groups, uh, and then talking through some of the other things like dealing with textual results and pathology and uh, dealing with comments that are added to results when they're filed, uh, sample types, those sorts of things. Um, so as Manish was saying, there are three projects that are uh, involved in the uh, curation. Um, I guess our aim is to, uh, so we've got uh, GP Connect uh, who are, are looking to export data from GPs, um, the National Pathology Programme who are looking at uh, um, various different things, including the blood sciences in particular at the moment, and they'll be working their way through and trying to write things like a, a, a unified code list, which is, uh, I'm sure Andrew, uh, sorry, Phil uh, Brennan will talk about a bit later, uh, and the GPIT uh, Futures Patient Record Migration Team, who are looking at um, uh, practice migrations and GP to GP, and again, I'll so we uh, here talking a, bit, a little bit about their project too. Um, so for my part, I'm obviously from the GP Connect program, I've worked a lot on GP to GP as well. Uh, I guess most of you will probably know a little about a bit about GP Connect. I guess the, the background is really that it's a, uh, an API that we're trying to develop that will uh, expose uh, GP data from the GP system suppliers via the spine. Uh, to a variety of different care settings, so uh, GP practices, uh, shared records, social care, hospitals, uh, for patient self-care as well, 111, things like that. Um, there are a number of different strands in the GP Connect program. Uh, there's a HTML view, which is a sort of read-only view of the patient record. There's a uh, ability to book and amend appointments. Uh, there's uh, the bit that we're interested in really from this call is the uh, structured data. So we're interested in being uh, exposing the data from uh, GP practices in a structured format that then people can uh, use. Uh, in, so it's machine readable as well as just patient readable. Uh, sorry, patient uh, readable. Um, so the scope of GP Connect is a uh, to look at, I suppose, it's not just our scope, but it, I mean, we're looking at a, developing a logical model that will replace the EDIFAC message. Um, we're aware as well that there are um, other test results that will have to use the observation resource, so we want to make sure that the way we curate the models will um, will work, work for those as well. Uh, and then there's also a case of test report and test result documents. So, for instance, it could be interesting to be able to send the EDIFAC message as it's received at the GP. Um, but for the moment, really, we're looking at uh, replacing, primarily replacing the EDIFAC message 
And uh, while we're doing that, we want to develop a model that will also support future data models. So we've been working with the, the National Pathology Programme, who are then uh, going to introduce uh, a more structured message for certain areas. And we want to make sure that um, any model that we develop will be able to support those models in the future. So, uh, Peter, I've got a question. Jonathan, Kay, do you want to come in? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm working on various aspects of this. Um, I chaired the message development group that produced what you're referring to as the Edifact message. I'm really concerned about that slide describing scope. Does all other test results mean all other investigations? Um, well, I'm talking from a GP perspective, so it could be blood pressure, it could be, yep. uh, you know, a radiology report. It, it could be a height, or it could be something as simple as that. Thank you. So that's within the HL7 fire definition of observations. That's an enormous scope, isn't it? Um, yes, but I, as I was just saying, that, that, that for, for the purpose of this curation, we're going to concentrate on the pathology. We're not going to concentrate on like the the um, the test results and the test result documents, so they're out of scope for the moment. So we know we know they exist, and we don't want to develop a model that will uh, inhibit us sending those things. So they're in our mind as we're developing the model, but they're out of scope for the moment. Who is so, carrying the risk that the logical model that uh, supports one, which I know intimately, is extensible for the other roles that are needed? Sorry, what do you mean by that exactly? Okay, the, the, the logical model of the Edifact message is a very stripped down version of HL7 version 2. Yeah. It, it's, so, yeah. So I think, so it's, I think actually, it's, it's actually ASTM 1238. Everything was thrown away in order to get something that could be implemented very quickly. So I think what, what, what we have done here, Jonathan, is we haven't started with Edifact. We have started with a logical data model, which is generic. Great. For, okay. Right. And, so, and then so, you have an instance that you will make sure will be able to replace what's currently being used the Edifact message. Yes, what we have right. done is, we, 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 first yeah. of all, the, the data model we have is agnostic of Edifact, okay? That yeah, yeah. was developed. And okay. then once we have this agnostic data model, we looked at Edifact to say, oh, okay, now how our data model is going to satisfy what's in the Edifact message? We right. have done that. Yes, I think Does it would that, be really helpful if it said that in the documents. Yeah, I think... Which it uh, doesn't well, at the moment. Okay, that, I'll take that. That's really helpful to hear it put like that. But no, the, that's the really good feedback, and we'll absolutely take that into consideration. Okay, the next question is the one of scope. So if you go back at a position there, you've got a GP aspect, you've got a laboratory aspect. Now, clinicians only see a small amount of the information flows that goes across things related to laboratory medicine, Yeah, that which includes... From the national project, for example, laboratory to laboratory, laboratory to quality assurance system, laboratory to central reporting systems. They have requirements at the data level that clinicians never see. Does Munich's answer about the scope of this also apply to those? That you want the big scope, but there are some early deliverables, or are those out of scope? So I will, I will let um, Phil come in from that pathology program. Phil, do you want to take this? With Sorry. Finley and, and Jack Kohler. Um, and all, all I can, get, I can do is really reiterate what Pete said. So the, the initial iteration of the work we're doing, um, certainly from a, a national pathology perspective, the focus is on um, blood sciences, so haematology uh, and chemical pathology. But we are absolutely aware that um, of the need to, in, in future iterations, consider other um, pathology disciplines. But our scope does does include primary and secondary care. Okay, so uh, so those I understand that in terms of disciplines. I'm worried about it because we're already sending microbiology reports, dynamic test results to clinicians, and this has a lower scope than that. But the other question was, from a laboratory's point of view, it's a bit that works quite well getting the reports out to clinicians. Because of the lack of data standards, they have a real problem in many other tasks that are facing them. And again, I would follow Munch's line and say, please can those be in the big scope, although certain deliverables may come earlier than others. 
for a, a great example of that in, in the uh, logical model is, do you need two accession numbers? If you're sending work between two laboratories, you need two accession numbers, but a clinician will never see them. But they're crucial to the logical model. Yes, and it's that kind of um, level of detail that we have picked up on in, the, in this initial iteration. So that specific example, actually, we have picked up on. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, I mean that, that slide there is, is my slide, and, and hopefully that sets out what I've just summarised. So uh, I know it's not ideal because uh, you know we want to design everything up front and get everything included from day one. But I, I guess the reality of the work we're doing, especially within the national pathology area, is for this initial iteration for this current financial year, that has been our formal scope as set out by the CCIO. But fully understand your concerns around the wider scope and the need to support a much wider uh, base. Okay, so oh, thank you for that. I won't, I won't pursue the argument there. Who's the SRO for that slide, please? Uh, ultimately, it's Simon Eccles, so the CCIO. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I think, Jonathan, what we're saying is in this iteration, um, and this is iterative design, this is not, you know, what we, this is the first version we're going to create. Lab to lab is out of scope. Um, and as we go through another sprint later on, we might include and, and enhance the data model, but data model by itself, as, as I said, is a logical model, which um, if we think when we get to lab to lab, we can add things to it. Um, okay. But I think... Well, I, I, probably, I'm new to this, I don't want to take it over, but I must warn you that not having the scope right at the state where you create the logical data model almost guarantees an enormous amount of reworking when the next thing comes into scope. Now, that is not true of implementation. Yeah, you can implement incrementally, but the idea that you can go back having created a logical data model and put big things like that into it that weren't considered originally carries a lot of risk. Okay. Um, okay, that's, I think, something programmed to consider as a risk. They will have to manage it. Um, and I think at the moment, the way this sprint is set up, I think we'll have to just go with the scope we got, and then we'll we'll revisit. And I think maybe you're right. We'll get to that situation, but I think that is something Phil, you need to capture as a program. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and I know Jonathan, you've already uh, so shared those concerns. Um, I mean, all I can do is reiterate is that you know the the, the focus of this work um, and and for the national pathology team as a whole as a stem from um, that initial bullet point there. So that that one of the key interoperability priorities from the CCIO. So that ability to share basic pathology results. Um, but yeah, okay. fully understand concerns. Right, we should move on. Um, Pete, do you want to carry on from where, where you were? Is that all right, Jonathan? Uh, your hand is still up. Do you, did you have any further comments? Thank you. Uh, okay, carry on, Pete. So I think I'll talk around the GP Conespo scope, which I think is very much GP focused, uh, and it's about being able to send what the GP can see. Uh, and again, when you know we're just looking at the uh, the things that they receive via an any back message in this part. Uh, did you want to talk more about your slide, Phil? Um, there's not much more to say, really. Um... There you go, Phil. Yeah, sort of. If, unless people got any more specific questions around that, I mean that that is kind of where we're at. Um, let's say we've we've got um, well a use case later on in the slide deck, um, which covers uh, requesting, but only really to provide context, um, as it states there, and as we've said from the start of this presentation, the focus is on reporting, but just provide some uh, business level context. We have considered requesting as well at a high level. So now, unless anybody's got any more questions on that slide, that's that's kind of it. Okay, I'll move on then. Uh, is John the lovely on the call? Um, yep. Hi, John. You Hi. Going? Yep. Sure. Um, yep. Um, so um, recently, um, obviously, as GPIT futures is is coming in, um, one of the kind of key areas for them. Um, is to uh, is to look and understand how um, we we're calling it patient record migration now. So um, how we effectively transfer and move data around between in a in a GDPR world, um, which is different from sharing. It's different from programs like STR or the the Lycras, um, and it's about how ownership. 
um, and kind of the data processors and the data controllers, how, how they all kind of safely, securely migrate patient data between, between themselves um, as, as patients and practices um, either change, you know, because they've moved house, or uh, from a patient point of view, or practices how they when they change when they decide to switch software supplier. Um, one of the key fo one of our first key focuses is actually around the current um, GP to GP. So looking, uh, measuring its current performance, um, identifying a risk improvement, and then effectively ho or hopefully trying to reduce the the failure rate in in the current version of GP to GP. But um, in the future, given the NHS, um, its current strategic direction is to move to fire-based messaging, um, we thought this was a good time to kind of get involved um, and start understanding if this is what the future looks like, um, how might, what, what does our data look like in terms of the HL7B3 message for GP to GP, um, and how it, how it would fit um, in a future world, because we're going to have lots of quote-unquote legacy information we've got to transfer around um, and if we were to use this new profile would that be possible um, etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, we've I, we believe we've got quite a similar scope to GP connect because um, we just care about the data and it getting across uh, and that is but down simple but as I'm sure we all know is very difficult um, and so yeah um, that's probably about it for me. If so I think we've, I've got a question for you from John Williams. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Um, just wondered if you could, could clarify, uh, perhaps give some examples of what you mean when you use the phrase failure rate of GP to GP. Is that failure in terms of record transmission and receipt, or is it failure as in inability to handle certain kinds of content, or is it both? Could you just clarify, please? Um, I think it's easier to say all of the above. I think so. Let's, if we, to give some examples, um, for instance, um, we know that the, or the, the fallback to paper and the, and the transfer of the large yard record um, doesn't currently meet the, the goals of kind of paperless, of a, of a paperless world. And, and whilst that's a lofty ambition to say we're going to get everything across, obviously. It's still at the moment there's still a requirement that the large yard record is sent, um, and the kind of the stuff that couldn't be sent is printed off and things like that. Um, the we do we're, we're considering that failure, but that's failure in a very long term way. So that isn't the focus of our initial set of failures. Um, our initial set of failures is things like why didn't this GP to GP message work? Um, for instance, let's say because of incompat incompatibility between versions. Um, because they try, you know, the, this is a large message, and so it can't be sent to a to a one point one practice, um, or and, and things like that. So it's looking at those areas first, then kind of <clears throat> moving out into well, if something bad happens in registration, how does that affect um, the GP to GP transfer? Does it allow it to happen or not? And then moving out again into well, how how would we make it so that it, there is there is no need for the paper to come at all. Okay, that's that's very helpful. Can I just follow up? Yeah, um, I mean, the first thing you mentioned obviously links into the business around digitization of uh, Lloyd yes. George envelopes. Yeah. Um, probably not, this is not the place to have a long discussion about <laughs> the pros and cons of that. Yes. Um, right. uh, but what I want to ask you is what what about a problem like the current difficulty in GP to GP in handling uh, interoperability of drug allergies. Is that, uh, would you, rec would you um, recognize that as, in quotes, a failure of GP to GP? Uh, the reason for raising it is as an ex-clinical uh, safe safety lead of GP to GP, it worries me that that's a residual safety problem which still hasn't been addressed. Yeah, um, and I think John in the... Waited talk about that John quickly um, I'll if I I'll do one sentence and see okay, if, it, sorry. If, it, if it covers your answer but please yes Pete is definitely knows more about this than I do um, but yeah I think that is definitely on our list I think that the initial the initial work is to to look at the catch the perception of GP to GP failure and to, to make sure that 
that that perception is true, false? Is it better than it is? Is it worse than it is? And uh, to make sure that everyone's on the same page about the current state. Um, and and only then, once we're kind of understanding what the, getting through those, what are kind of technical difficulties first, um, with a with a mind to understanding quality and saying, where is data quality causing clinical safety issues after that? That's very helpful. I mean, clearly all the stuff you're talking about is vitally important, but I just yeah. wanted to check about the uh, the safety issue as well. Thank you very much. Pete, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, John, that the uh, the allergy archetype uh, is a day one requirement for GP IT futures. Still, Pete, still a day re day one requirement. We've been that's been a top requirement for us for a long time, hasn't it? Yes, <laughs> I would disagree with that, but it's definitely in the day one requirement for GPIT futures and suppliers will be excellent. Um and yeah I think that's it from me now, unless there's any more questions. No more questions, carry on. So yeah I think it's the next slide. Oh, yeah please. All right, I'll hand over whoever, whoever's taking over next. Yeah, uh, that's me. Um, so we have a high-level a high level, um, logical model for, uh, for, the, um, for what we're going to curate. So obviously it's uh, all about test reporting, really. Uh, and so the test report is obviously the, the vital part of that. Uh, and it can relate to uh, a number of test groups, which could relate to in turn to a number of test results. The test report could also link to test results um, directly, uh, and uh, all of those things can link to the specimen. Uh, there are a number of other sort of uh, areas we've been looking at. So within the test report, uh, there's likely to be a summary of the test request, uh, and also it's possible for um, uh, clinicians to add um, comments as they file reports. So that's a, another area we're looking at. Uh, as I mentioned previously, we did talk about uh, test report documents. So that could be in a test report document might be the actual edifact document the GP received the results in. Uh, and we've left space if we did ever want to send them uh, that, uh, as part of the message. Uh, and also uh, we've left space for results that might come as a document, whether that be an image or a graph or something like that too. Uh, it's worth as well where we say test groups. Uh, there are many names for test groups. Uh, they can be called batteries, panels, profiles, uh, uh, and we've gone for kind of a, a, a neutral name. But really, we find test groups anything that the lab has deemed a group of tests. Uh, so obviously, the, the, uh, the language is key there, and sometimes different things, different names mean different. Uh, uh, there's many names to call test groups, just to recognise that. Um, so, some example use cases. Phil, this is. So, Pete, I've got a question. Jonathan? Mm -hmm. Go back to the model. Have any, like, is there a concept of a report that relates to more than one specimen? Uh, yes, so we've uh, modelled it so that the, a report could have many specimens. Thank you. Is there a status of report, interim, overwrite, final? Uh, I think the the. Um... I think the diagnostic report profile has got a status in it. Yeah, the, it's a required field in fire, so that there are a, a certain statuses that you have to use. Okay. Is, is, there's a link there. Yeah. Does that include the, the sort of questions and answers we've just done? Yeah. Yes, uh, oh, no, no, no. Yes, it will. I think that's actually a link to a more detailed version of the model, which right. might not answer the questions you've just yeah. done. But uh, well, the, right. the, in, the, um, in the spreadsheets on DDM, which obviously you're probably more interested in the detail, uh, you, you'd be able to look through the, the DDM, which goes through it. 
field by field, and you can see the cardinalities. Yep, thank you for that. You see, the bit I don't understand is, I know that these are all there in fire because they're all there from HL7 2.1 onwards. The question is, I don't know what's being taken out in order to cover the scope that was in the earlier slide. How do, how do we find out about things that if you knew about HL7, you would know that they were there, as in the answer to the question you just gave, but someone has taken them out for this project? Well, nothing has been taken out, Jonathan. The principle of design of fire is that we'll, we'll never delete anything from the international fire profiles anyway. Um, and um, all the time we'll delete anything from the international profile if we can find a clinical safety issue, which we haven't found in this case. So we're going to use the genetic information profile with some UK tailoring, which we're going to discuss today. Um, but apart from that, as a scope, we are going to use the international fire profile as close to as possible. Okay, I don't want to prolong this bit. That sounds inconsistent with the previous answers on scope, but we'll, we'll take we'll, we'll take that afterwards. Thanks. Okay. Um, Any other questions on on the model? No. No. Carry on. Phil? Thanks, Pete. Yeah, so this next slide uh, presents a very simplified generic process flow for um, test requesting and reporting. And as I said on, on one of my previous slides, um, obviously the focus of what the work we're doing is reporting. Uh, but just for context, this slide uh, does talk about requesting as well. It's very, as you can see, it's very simple. So there are no exception flows. It's very much a, a happy path view of a typical process. Obviously, there'll be a lot of variation in process depending on the particular care setting, um, the type of sample, where the sample's collected, etc. cetera. Um, as I said, there are no exception flows, for example, handling um, uh, missing samples or samples that can't be used. But hopefully provides uh, some context. And it also introduces down the left-hand side some of the key groups of actors um, in terms of organizations and practitioners that are involved in in the process um, and, are con and are supported by the FIRE model. So I don't know if anybody's got any, any questions of that. appreciate it's quite um, difficult to read, but hopefully you can, you can make some sense of it. If not, if we can move on to the next slide, Pete, please. Yeah. Jonathan, your hand is up. Is it from the previous time or you've got another question? Out of scope, please. Schedule testing without an explicit request, point of care testing, and patient initiated testing. I didn't, I didn't catch the start of that question. Sorry, sorry, Jonathan. Okay, you, you've got that. You described that as generic. That's generic for a classical request report cycle, but there are lots of others, such as scheduled uh, tests without explicit requests, point of care testing, and patient initiated testing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for the, basically, you know, given the time constraints we've got on this call, um, this well, the, the, the slide we're looking at now focuses on primary care, which, as I say, is that classic pathway. But we do recognise there are, there are uh, variations yeah. and other. So, uh, and again, I'm not asking for flows. I'm asking a question about scope. Is, is this product supposed to support patient-initiated testing, for example, anticoagulant work? Is it supposed to include point-of-care testing? So I think I, I can take this one. Sure. Hi, hey, uh, hi, Jonathan. So I think we need to be pragmatic about how we look at this. So as you pointed out, this is not really about information flows. This is really the scope of this project. And every time we mention scope is to say, how would that message look like? What you're also looking at and you're interested in, and for the right reasons, is also the places where some of this you know, information flows from or where it flows to. And at the moment, point of care testing and some of the other places you mentioned, context you mentioned, are out of scope. What it doesn't out mean... Out of scope. Out, they are out of scope, yes. Because we have a whole bunch of point of care testing that actually PHE would love to include not just in this, but also in SNOMED, which is actually missing in terms of coding. Does it make sense? So there are... Let, let's let's I, I would probably say let's reflect on the fact that labs been sat there for a long, long time and we need to address it. We cannot address it in one fell swoop, which means we are to say if we now have a, a, a test 
result that needs to be controlled by a irrespective context, let's first of all agree what would be in that message. And that's what the spec is really saying. Phil, in his other job, or in, you know, when he's not busy doing this, is actually going around recording the information flows and the points, different places where information originates from. When that work is complete, that's when we will say, is this message spec as it currently stands fit for use or not fit for use? My gut would be that it would actually work because HL7 International have done some thinking because the message itself wouldn't change. There might be things around it that might become more or less important. Does that make sense? And this probably also relates to the previous question you were saying, right? Every time we say out of scope, it doesn't mean that we are actually chopping off bits of what already exists in the standard. The standard as it stands can support them if they currently support it. So we're not preventing people from using them. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's Ian McNichol here. Just to add to that, because it may be helpful, we, we have an idea when we're doing this curation of saying, look, these are the curated data points within the, the, the resource or profile. And here are the things that we're leaving in, but we haven't curated. In other words, we're not, we're not, as Jay says, we're not chopping things out, but we're saying, look, we, we, we understand that other people, other wider groups may want to use this and we're not, we're not stopping them use it. But what we have to do is curate this against some very specific known examples that we can get our head around and then extend that scope of curation so it's about you know it's about limiting the scope of the curation process and the thinking rather than particularly locking down the, the models yeah and, and i think and i think again and i'm just conscious because lots of people have actually joined this call and they're probably you know thinking well we're not quite sure what it covers it it does so fire hl7 fire international standard if you look at it one aspect of what they are now working on is the whole workflow process yes they're actually starting to actually recognize that actually workflows are just as important as the message blocks themselves and nothing that we're doing now prevents people from actually taking those aspects of workflows and incorporating them into their information flows if that's what they choose to do we do not restrict them from doing it all we're saying is, as a as a, an agreed specification, we haven't yet curated and agreed that this will work for across England for different case settings or different contexts. So I think part of me feels, Jonathan, once we describe or design the pattern in prior to you and give you a bit more detail, I think that will give you a bit more comfort that we the design is very generic. The design pattern we are recommending is going to be very generic using fire, which should be able to meet most of the use cases, we believe. And maybe if we run through these, this call and come back to in one hour's time when we have gone through the design patterns, that will probably give you a bit more confidence that even though the scope we start with, yeah. The scope we start with is quite constrained, but when we come to design, we are using very generic patterns. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, uh, particularly thanks to Jay and, and Ian for those comments. What I think what I'm really saying is that the first slides in the slide pack and every briefing should describe that scope in the way that you've just done it, because it's very hard to understand that. I've actually asked this question explicitly. It's the first time I've had answers that look like that. With those, we can then go to bodies like Royal College of Pathologists and particularly system developers to make it really clear what the relationship is between the full functionality of HL7 Fire and what this project does. Because without that, it's very hard for them to understand all those other flows that they have to manage where they fit together. Because it's not this, this presentation isn't framed to describe what you've just told me verbally. That's and fine. That's, that's, that's useful feedback, Jonathan. And I think we'll amend, the, we'll, we'll amend the presentation beginning, definitely the scope slides to um, capture the way I have described to you that we are handling it. And I think you're right. It, it, from the beginning, it sounds like we're doing very small bit and people won't be able to work on the wider scope, uh, which is not the case. Right. Um, any other questions? Okay, carry on. Okay, thank you everyone. So, um, yeah, so we've just seen a, very, a generic process flow out with a discussion around that and, and the wider scope um, issues. So this uh, is an example use case. It's not the only use case, that obviously, that we're considering. But again, in the interest of time, we've, we've, we've uh, included this particular one. So again, the sort of classic pathway 
uh, of a test report um, that's been requested from primary care. Um, so again, in the interest of, you know, there's only so much detail you can put on a single slide, it is a, a simplified use case description, but hopefully gives you a, a, a flavor and, and a bit more context in terms of the process. So appreciate there's a lot of detail in there, but um, I don't know if anybody's got any specific questions. If not, um, if we can move on to the next slide, Pete, please. So this is a patient journey or a, a scenario, so effectively an instance of the, the use case shown on the previous slide. So just provides a, um, a, a specific example of, of how that use case could work uh, with an example test report. Um, this particular one is a profile, so um, a set of observations, obviously values, units of measure, and reference ranges. Uh, and in this particular case, there's a comment relating to one of the observations at the bottom there. So again, just to provide additional context. So unless anybody's got any questions on that one, I think the next slide is a GP Connect use case. Yeah, so this is just uh, similar to Phil. We've just put the one use case in. There's obviously uh, a lot of very similar use cases really for GP Connect, and it's all about um, the flow of data from the GP systems to a different care setting. In this case, we've picked a, a like a like hospital admission, uh, so that the uh, if someone uh, the hospital admission needs to see the uh, pathology results, they'd be able to request them from GP Connect, and that could be the same. Uh, there's very similar use cases for different care settings, so community pharmacy or uh, mental health, or uh, there's there's lots of different. Uh, Use cases that are very similar. It's quite clear. Is there any questions? Yeah, we've got, we've got a question from John Williams. Uh, yes, could I ask, please? Uh, you've got their uh, clinician request clinical summary from the uh, Leica interface, and you've got the statement that the Leica determines what information it requires for the clinical summary. That all sounds very technical. I'm hoping that somewhere there's some human clinical input as to what actually will make up that summary. Where's that work being done to determine what will be in that summary and what won't? Um, I guess that would be done at the micro level. So, I mean, it, it, it's just an example of in you know, a local care record might um, include pathology results, and this will give it the option to do that. So, how they define their local care record will all be their decision. and. It just gives them another way of uh, pulling data into that local care record. So, so every every Leica could have a different kind of summary. Is that what you're saying? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I guess the information that they get from GP Connect will always be consistent, but they they could choose to display that in different ways. Yeah, hi, hi, Mike here, business analyst here. I mean, that's kind of the key point of GP Connect is we're not trying to uh, design different local scenarios like what's needed by a pathologist uh, when they view this or by a emergency, uh, so someone in an emergency center compared to what needs to be seen by a cardiac care nurse or what needs to be seen by a community pharmacist. They're going to vary. So our, idea, our point is we make, we're make we working not just in pathology but across the entire GP record and making it available in a way. What we're not trying to do is tell a local trust this is what a summary should look like, this is what this should look like. What we're saying is that's the sort of stuff you would work, you understand with your, based on your local needs and your local clinical uh, understanding. And we're there to make sure once you know what you want that you can get that data. So, so, does so that, I think, sorry, so, can so I just follow up? I just want to ask, does that mean then that, a, that you would expect a, a Leica to tailor the summaries according to the use case? Uh, that's really what's behind my question. Uh, I think it would that would be a discussion of the Leica, because the Leica might decide that actually all our conditions are very simple and for a practice practically say it, we're going to have a standard summary across our entire Lycra. Or the Lycra might decide, actually, because of the way that it, it community uses it as compared to our hospital uses it, we're going to have multiple views 
or you could even get to really clever ones where pay, where a clinician could set their own summary, though that's getting into the more complicated scenarios. But the idea is we're not at the center, we're not trying to say what, uh, how a local area should look and view our data. We want to give them that uh, capability to decide themselves based on their own clinical input. So, so John, I think my understanding is what GP can is trying to do is expose the data in certain fire profiles. How they are joined up or bundled up or presented is 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 a discussion, and I think it's a reasonable comment. There, there has to be, they they, should, they can they can be kind of standardisation there. But I think that's kind of out of scope for GP Connect. It's more to do with like a program when they do do it regionally, whether they want to have a standard view per clinician or user type, or they want to have a summary view. But I think. Here, the clinical summary is more of a example, Ray, but I don't think it's up to GP Connect program to define what that is for a Lycra. Uh, would it be worth actually making a comment to that effect? Because if that had been in there, I might not have needed to raise this issue. Yeah, I think it's I another think... one of these things of, of of making it clear, you know, that that you expect someone else to be doing that kind of work. It is out of scope for this project. I fully understand that. But, but otherwise, it leads it leads to people to say, well, what what summary is that? Is there a standard summary? Yeah. Is it the same yeah, as a yeah. summary care record? So if you if you had something that just explained everything that's just been said, it might be helpful. Yeah, we'll do that. I think again, I think as a feedback, we need to get to the word clinical summary here, um, clinical request, GP record, so to speak. Um, and I think because the clinical summary implies somebody summarizing it and who is doing it. So I think we just need to be very clear that what's in scope and out of scope. Okay. Shall we move on? Okay, carry on. Um, yep. So this slide is just really saying, looking at the, the logical model and saying which resources we're looking at using for each of the um, areas that we're, we're going to curate. So obviously the test report is going to be a diagnostic report. Uh, the model we're, we're proposing, the test group header, will be uh, an observation, and in each of the test results will be an observation. Uh, the specimen, obviously, will be in the specimen resource. Uh, where we've got um, uh, result, uh, comments against the reports as they're filed, we've said we'll capture them in an observation resource as well. Uh, and then the other part, which is uh, perhaps a little different, is where we're sending a summary of the test request. We said we're going to send that in a procedure request. Um, I guess that's probably uh, slightly more contentious because the, the, the request may not have been sent in a procedure request, and it's probably worth remembering that. So we, you, but we've used that to send those details. Any questions about that? No. Again, the, the next um, slide is this is sort of a detail in some of the reports, um, the resources that we use. Uh, you can see the different colored boxes on the slide. The green boxes are, are resources that we've not been through curation at all before. Um, so diagnostic report is actually included in that as well. So diagnostic report, procedure request and specimen haven't previously been curated. So they'll be new to the curation process. Um, the uh, light blue boxes in the left-hand corner, uh, patient practitioner, organization practitioner on condition, they've all previously been curated. And we're not, we're, we're proposing to use them as is. I don't think there's any change in how we're using them. Uh, all the other boxes so uh, uh, are actually about uh, observations, which has been through creation as a resource, but I suppose we're, the, the use cases are slightly different than what, what the observations have been used for previously uh, and probably a, a bit more detailed. So we're, we're looking at those again too. So uh, you can see there that the, we use an observation for a number of different things. The orange box is for filing comments that we talked about previously. Uh, the blue boxes are for the individual results. Uh, and you can see that there may, may be referenced di from the diagnostic report or as part of the uh, a battery or a, a, a group, a test group, uh, and so the purple box there is the test group header, which is also going to be an observation. Uh, on that slide, any questions about it? 
like it just is a different, almost just a different way of collecting the previous version. No. I think uh, at this point, there's probably uh, probably worth pointing out that the ways of dealing with test groups, there are a number of different ways. So this, the part on the right hand side, uh, th there's a number of different options of how you can deal with that. And Fire suggests three options, which is diagnostic report and result, observation and observation component, and observation with related observations. So we're just going to talk through each of those options uh, quickly. So the first option with the diagnostic report as the group header and the individual observations as, a, as results. So linked directly to the diagnostic report. And you can see the uh, just snippets of the fire profile that I've added in for the fields that we'd be using for that. Obviously, uh, you know, in this um, arrangement, you'd, in the group header, you'd have your full blood count, and then in each of the results, you'd have things, you know, individual elements, such as white blood cell count, hemoglobin, etc. Um, obviously, if you were going to do it that way, some reports at the moment send multiple uh, test groups. So you'd need end up having multiple diagnostic reports. Uh, you know, that could create a bit of clutter, really. Um, so any questions about that? Just going to carry on. So Pete, so Pete, do you want to open the diagnostic report resource and just show people the option one how it will look in the resource if if, if we, so, yeah. so using this method, the diagnostic report would sit. Um, contain the code, which would be the uh, full blood count or the, the battery header, and then each of the results would be linked through the results, references to observations, and the specimens would be linked by the specimen resource. So, I think that's fairly clear. So, I'll talk through the next one. Um, I got a question here from Damien. Um, yeah, it's uh, David Murphy. Just from a, a forward compatibility perspective, uh, Fire R4 doesn't have procedure request anymore. Um, it, it seems to have been replaced by a more generic service request. Yes, um, I, I, I appreciate that, and I think that um, we need somewhere to put the details related to the test request. and. The, the, I, I don't know how else you would do it. You oh, yeah. could do it as a, an extension, but we thought it would be better to use something that was standard. Uh, we realise that the service request is coming in in the next version, uh, and if we can make it so it would be compatible with that, we definitely will. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it is very clearly uh, a request, and it's and it's a reference to to that request. It's it was purely a matter of. Uh, um, forward compatibility, given that we already know uh, that procedure request as such is on its way out. Uh, yeah, um, we have looked at the, the service request and hopefully we'll, we'll try and um, do it in such a way that we don't use fields that uh, aren't in the service request. Thank you. Okay, I've got another question which says, does the message have the ability to include measurement of uncertainty for the various observations? Um, well, I kind of jump in the gun a little bit because that's one of our extensions, I suppose. Uh, in fire, there's, the comparators don't include an approximate sign, uh, which would, uh, I suppose, uh, be used to deny uncertainty. Um, so we, we're, we're proposing extending for that. Uh, Kind of. Yeah, that's fine. We'll come back to it because it's it's in the pack anyway. It's coming later, so that's fine. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, I right, got Jay. Oh, sorry. Um, just a, just a quick note on that. You know, test results and Fire 4.0. I think the broad design principle also would be worth documenting, and this is just for the internal team to actually say. 
case how we are actually going to maintain forward compatibility with 4.0 as a principle and, and also broadly to say test request is something which is a stub at the moment but the next iteration of the pathology work will specifically look at it so for example if you look at what genomics is actually really trying to do it is a lot about test requests than test results at the moment so again part of the incremental scope or the approach that we're taking is when we get to that point we would say and this is how this will get fleshed out and it'll get curated just so uh, I think for the internal team, it'd be worth actually documenting some of it just based on previous comments as to how we intend this to be rolled out and used by system developers. Yeah, so I think we have looked at all for where possible and and uh, try to make it future proof. But I think the the point that's a good principle, and Jay, we're going to capture it as a general design principle for curation um, moving forward. But I think the point Damien raised is really helpful because I think we do need to look into it. Um, from a, as a core team perspective. Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to move to option two? Okay. Yeah. Um, so option two the, was the using uh, an observation code to hold the battery or uh, test group header and uh, individual observation components. So if I just quickly. Look in the observation resource. So this would be using the code to hold the battery header, and then the component code and value to hold the individual results. Uh, so obviously we've considered that as well, but we think that uh, components, according to the power spec, also they say they should be used for measurements that have been taken at the same time by the same device. I mean, obviously blood pressure is one that fits that very clearly, um, but it's not necessarily going to be true for all the different um, results that we're going to want to send. Uh, also, the nested structure might make it more difficult to query, uh, and it may make it, uh, might restrict the ability to, to search against particular results. Any questions about option two? No, keep going. So option three is our recommended option, um, uh, and this is where uh, it, it, and it's worth pointing out as well that all these would be contained within a diagnostic report um, with the other resources uh, as stated on the, the, the kind of uh, earlier slide. Um, but yeah, this is with an observation, uh, separate observation to hold the uh, test group header information. Um, Again, we'd use the information resource. Up. So, so again, we'd use the uh, code to hold the observation resource. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out. I think um, Chris from TPP asked or, uh, about, or, or Will asked about the value. Uh, obviously, it's, it's an optional element, so you wouldn't expect a value at the header level necessarily. Um, and then we'd use the related uh, element to. Uh, relate other observations that, that contain the results. So you, uh, you end up with a sort of nested observation um, structure. Uh, and the reason we're recommending that is because it's a very flexible structure and it will allow for different patterns. And uh, so far, I don't think we've found any patterns that it wouldn't support. Although obviously, you know, part of the reason for this call is if you think there are patterns that, that wouldn't fit this model, and, you know, if you could raise a tuss, it'd be really helpful. Uh, uh, but hopefully it will provide a, a single consistent way of modeling. See, Damien's got his hand up. May I make a suggestion, rather than using an extension for uh, the error bars, to have a related observation with a range in it? So you have a, a, a focus observation with your actual uh, stated value, and then a related observation with, the, with with a range in it with the with the uncertainty. Just a thought. I'm not quite sure what you mean. <laughs> Sorry. Uh... Um. Well, rather than introducing an extension to uh, observation to carry. Um, the uncertainty in a measurement. So you've got a measurement plus a set of error bars. Um, 
to have a related observation that carries the, the uncertainty. So you would have a value and say a quantity uh, in the value with, <coughs> with its units and then another observation in the, in, in, in the bundle uh, referenced via the uh, related um, attribute that carried the uncertainty. So like a qualified by related observation? Qualified by, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, that's uh, an interesting idea and we can definitely look at that. Just, uh, a, just a thought. Yeah, and I guess it would give you more flexibility because it wouldn't necessarily uh, be tied down to one concept. I'm just slightly thing. nervous about in, uh, about extensions, um, particularly given that much of the uh, the industry interest in, in this is international, and for the, the scope for exercises similar to this one in other countries coming to slightly different conclusions, and the closer we can get to generic fire uh, for this uh, the, as as documented uh, in in the fire resource list um the m the less itchy i get about it but maybe that's just me um no no i think, no, I, think I think that's another thing as a design principle um we avoid extensions as well as much as possible so i think that's a very good suggestion i think we'll definitely look into it um and uh, see if we can, you know, need to have that, an extension if we don't need. Mike, Stacey, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just want to clarify, when we talk about uncertainties, uh, could you give a, sort of an example? Is it like a 12 plus or minus 2 or something like that? Or have I misunderstood you? Coming from a non-pathology background. <laughs> Hello? Uh, hang on a minute, Pete is on mute. Pete, do you want to come in? Oh, you're on mute again. I'm going to jump in there because I, I, I'm... Yeah, I go ahead, Pete. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess the way we, or the thing we were looking to model was approximate because we know that there was a... Yeah, that's kind of why I wanted to clarify because I'm wondering whether what we've done previously is very different from what's being asked about. So is this about things like standard deviations and other variations where you have actually a measured uncertain level of uncertainty as opposed to I think what we did at least when I was involved about a couple of weeks ago where we just had a uh, more a, an approximate, which is just a general level, of, which just says approximate, it doesn't say. Yeah, I was just going to ask who asked, the, who asked the question in the chat initially. Do they want to come in and qualify what, exactly what they meant? So it was George Philip. George, do you want to come in? Yeah, hi, everybody. Yeah, just um, certainty. It's uh, a requirement in certain territories that uh, for each observation that the laboratory report that they specify what their measurement of uncertainty is. And it's uh, you know it's certainly coming into vogue. So I'm just wondering what scope we had in the message to report that as and when that becomes mandated. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think at this point we haven't covered that. So it sounds to me like that might be a new thing that we need to just get a bit more information about. And. Hi, hi, so George, when you just, can I just come back in? Uh, you know, obviously, Damien makes a really good point that we shouldn't be adding extensions. Um, you know, willy nilly. However, handling it as a as a sub observation, in a sense, you just get into the same problem uh, unless you can assume that everyone else internationally is doing the same thing. So, whilst it would be, you know, it's going to be technically not an extension in terms of what or producers are expecting to do with something like uncertainty, a new data point. It, it just it moves the it moves the story around a little bit. I don't think it solves it. So I think ultimately this is about taking. We, we, you know, observation is, is, is a perfectly reasonable approach, probably the best one, but we also need to take those ideas back uh, and discuss them with international colleagues because presumably other people are having the same problems and the danger is that they'll be solving them in their own ways, which may not line up with ours. Yeah, I must say I'd be very nervous about moving uncertainty into a separate uh, entity or fire profile because uncertainty is part of the whole result. So effectively, you're now putting the result across multiple fire, pro uh, single result across multiple fire profiles. Yeah, 
So there's a risk that people will see the first profile and not realize there's an uncertainty attached to it. Again, from a, a forward compatibility perspective, though, uh, I'm fairly sure observation has a lot, rather large and prominent N beside it in, in 4. Yeah, it does. So it's uh, but by by far release four, it's it's regarded as normative. So um, it's very important to have those discussions. Um, that observation doesn't actually carry uncertainty. Maybe a failing in, in in observation, but will possibly not have uh, the opportunity to go back and revisit that at this stage. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess our, uh, our our decision to sort of consider an extension for approximate actually did come from recommendations on Zulip, which is the uh, website. So you know, we we were t we were taking advice from the the international community, I suppose. Uh, but I, I think that it's definitely a, an interesting point and one that we'll definitely look into. Okay, um, Jade, did you have a comment? No, I was just going to say we should probably consult the international community, and there will always be things that we need to extend. I mean, 4.0 is normative, but hey, before we know, 4.0.1 will be out, and there will be something in it, just like we found out about fasting status, right? So I think Ian's suggestion to take it to the international community is the right thing to do. We should probably take it through multiple channels, is what I'd say. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. Um, I think Dave Henderson from our team, can you post that in the lip and get some feedback? Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of include that in our discussions. Yep, I can do that. Okay, do you want to move on, Pete, to the next section? Yeah, um, I suppose this is sort of acknowledging that although there's a desire of, um, to move to more structured messaging for, for certain areas. A lot of the results at the moment coming from labs are still text, and it's just sort of saying how we're gonna uh, deal with that, and I suppose the proposition at the moment is to deal with the text result in, a, in an observation that we would use for a, a result uh, using the value string. Again, much like GP to GP handles it in the HL7 version uh, three message, and again, we use that pattern for things like microbiology, which also has text-based results at the moment. Questions about that? Jonathan? You call that text based, but that's actually categorical. That's not, that one isn't te te text based. Yeah, sorry, what do you mean? Text. Text. One of the examples John mentioned in his river message, where, you know, it's it's actually it's just nicely formatted as but it is a bit, it's a chunk of text. Ah, okay. I, I, I wonder if that's a great example for what you're trying to say here, because it gets into the issue of tables, um, you know, which rely on alignment. We've had problems with uh, proportional fonts. That, that example there, you're saying is only text, but looks like a table. Yeah, and it, it, it is I, something I, John, I, I John would, Williams raised on driver. John, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yes, I mean, Jonathan, I think it might be a mini light bulb moment perhaps but in gp to gp we came across this and it it frequently went wrong when we were uh, taking on new suppliers we had to be really careful about uh, text because there are all sorts of things you've mentioned formatting changes there's how white space gets uh, handled and if you're not careful things get stripped out and then you end up with uh, the uh, columns being misaligned and giving you exactly the wrong result to a human reader. So this is a really important point that if we have got text that's structured in this way, uh, there needs to be great care taken to make sure that that structure is maintained across every transition. Do we have any further questions about that? Um, Jonathan, you had it still up. Did you have further comments? No, I, I just haven't got the hang of the technology. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, carry on. Um, again, we've talked about uh, file and comments, um, and we said we'd hand, handle them in observations. 
uh, again, to, to avoid any expansions and those sorts of things. Uh, and this is just a bit of a, uh, where they would fit. We'd say, at the moment, um, comments that are at the report level, we would reference from the result. Uh, and I think the, the thing that we need to confirm really is we need a, a terminology that we could put in the code to indicate that they're filing comments. Uh, so we'd need a, probably a SNOMED code to, to signify that, which we, we're looking into. We haven't got a, a, a code that we're going to use yet, but uh, I think Andrew will probably look at that in, in due course. Uh, and in uh, each of the other levels, so the um, test group level and the test level, we'll handle comments uh, in the related uh, observations uh, with using the qualified by um, option in the type. Have any questions about that? No, I think we've got no questions, but I think this is another good example where we have avoided a, um, any kind of extension by um, for filing comments using another instance of observation resource to capture those. Uh, just just one comment from me, you see, um, I mean, we're aware that some of the GT systems actually have quite sophisticated, um, you know, filing parts of the record that, you know, lots of tick boxes and check boxes to, to support workflow and pre-cooked messages. Our decision here was not to try to replicate that or standardize it. This is just a way of capturing pretty well some kind of, um, you know, textual representation in, in quite a simple way. Well, I think we recognize that actually doing that standardization might be very valuable in terms of, you know, distributed workflow for the future, but it, you know, it would require a whole, going down a whole different field of activity at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the next uh, thing we were going to ask about really is um, specimen type. So we weren't really sure how much it was used within. In any fact, it's a, a text field, and um, I suppose we were discussing the value of it and what sort of a value set we should be looking for it. So we're really after some input from suppliers as to, at the moment, does it get used, and are there particular use cases for having this structured and coded, or is it something that people think is less useful? So, Pete, do you want to load up the specimen resource and show where the type is? Yeah. So in specimen, we have type, which is a codable concept, the kind of material that forms a specimen. So do you, want to, do, do, do you want to open up this list? So I think what we're discussing as core team is either the number of options, either we can give a SNOMED value set for it, or people could use the example value set, which is here or they can just use the text. But the question is, what is the significance of this in terms of current use? Um, and how do, if, if people will use it for any kind of querying, uh, what is the current use case for having this field? Um, any input from suppliers would be really helpful. So um, any lab system suppliers, oh, here's Chris here. Um, Lee Webb from Clinters, do you have any view? <laughs> I do, yeah. No, I, mean, I think it is important for us to capture that um, separately from, uh, separately within the limbs and therefore to be able to send it out to, uh, to downstream systems. There are some tests that can be performed on, that can be performed on multiple specimen types and the interpretation uh, may be different depending on what specimen type it is. Partic I'm thinking particularly some of the viro virology molecular tests. Uh, there are different specimen types and different container types that you might receive. So that personally, yeah. I think it's important, and I, I'd be quite happy to just stick with the SNOMED CT definition of uh, specimen types. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Munish, Munish, sorry, uh, this is last though. Sorry, I can't put a, can't put up my hand. That's the reason. But I think it's important from the pathologist's point of view as well is to know because several sort of things are done on certain type of specimens and it could be used for demand management and lots of other things as well. Thank you. Yeah, echo that. Thanks, Lefa. Okay. That seems to be coming towards SNOMED CT. If we use SNOMED CT, any suppliers, would they have any major issues with it? 
um, if you have. So I see. Can I just make a comment? Just from from experience of seeing how this is used in in V two messages in particular, I'm conscious that there, you know, it's clearly an important bit of information. But there's a lot of a lot of things that I've seen that don't lend themselves to a simple a simple SNOMED code. You know, they maybe actually carry a mix of a mix of ideas, the type certainly, the method, sometimes even the the you know the the, the style of container you know, citrated blood or whatever. Um, so it, it, that, that's, that's my concern, that if we try to restrict this to SNOMED coding, we're going to make it very difficult for legacy messages in particular to, to operate. Somebody's going to have to untangle that. OK. Thanks, Ian. Fred? Fred, we can't hear you. Are you muted? Sorry, I had double muted myself on the microphone as well. Uh, just to add to the previous speaker, I, I think beyond the, the blood type or, or, or the, the, the anticoagulant in, in, in the tube, I would almost like to see the, the, descript the size of the tube ref referred to as well, because more and more uh, we have labs that try to interface order entry directly with transport systems and the decision to route something one way or another is more is quite often linked to the type of to the physical type of tube as well as much as the the contents of the tube so my just just to go back to what i was i was trying to say um look there, there are many many things we could standardize and actually the, the <laughs> model does support a lot of these, including you know specimen quantity, and there's a separate place place for additive, there's a separate place for um, you you name it. There's lots of different. <laughs> so so we could go go back to the lab community and say, look, there's sufficient demand that we should try and tidy this up. As Ferris just said, the problem is that's not where we are now. Um, that would need a lot of coordination between um, all the different labs to agree on those standards. It would mean. Uh, you know, quite a lot of reworking of current messaging, as I understand it. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I've, I've had a, a, a you know, negative experience. But my understanding from seeing a number of V2 messages is that people are just lobbing a lot of these different concepts into uh, type. And we may not be, a, it may not be high value at the moment to try to sort that out. Okay, Andrew Perry. I was, I was going to say but, um, probably the same thing as Ian is, is that you know this, this specimen type is, is one single attribute of the specimen resource in, in, in fire and you know, and from a point of view of, of kind of future proofing us we, we, we should stick to you know the, the, the proper use of, of, of this attribute um, and kind of you know where, where people are talking about you know, ad additives and container sizes, those those can be represented in this resource, but they, they shouldn't, you know, we definitely shouldn't conflate them into this this attribute. And yeah. just in terms of the, 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 the SNOMED binding on that, that's the, you know, so that there is a SNOMED on fire group that's, that's kind of run, you know, curated through, through, through SNOMED that has a lot of um, eight, eight or seven um, contributions. And, and that is the terminology binding that, that has been suggested for this. For, you know, the, 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 the one on the, on the previous slide was, was the terminology binding that has been suggested by the, the Snowman on Fire group. There are, you know, there, there, there are some other, you know, one of the things they suggested is that, you know, specimen type isn't, possibly isn't the, the most accurate name for the attribute, but kind of that, that might get pushed back to, to, to fire. And there's a, there's a, a two way flow of, of kind of information between the semi on fire group and, and the, you know, the fire technical authors. Uh, Jay, do you want to come in? Hey, Manish. So I think <clears throat> I wrote down what I was going to say on comments as well. I, I think it's really nice to be on these calls where people actually make case for having something in, but also other people make the case for not having something in. 
I would broadly say there are two other. Oh, yeah. Closing section you want. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Carry on, Jake. Hey. All right. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Jonathan, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you, Jake. Carry on. Yes, yeah, so I was. I was just leaving my thoughts on the comment section where I was saying, in fact, that you know, the path. The, it's great to be on these calls where I see people making making cases for why something should be done, but other people say, well, here's why we don't want to do this. Broadly, I think this is the problem we have in, in the pathology program where we have different iterations for looking at different areas of work. These this conversation to me feels to be in two specific areas test request side of it and specimen tracking because if you want to do specimen details and other things there's definitely a need and we all know just because we hl and v2 doesn't know it or somebody doesn't do it it still happens at the moment right so we are not yet there to address it so i would say as a program we put these comments and requests as, as a backlog and we get around to the iterating into let's look at specimen requests uh, specimen sample tracking you know that's when we pick these up. So for now, the common broad comment I would say is stick to what FHIR does it. Let's not debate whether it should be snowbed or not. If FHIR allows the you know, specimen and the container types to be represented, anybody who wants to use them now can use them. Okay, so I think there's a proposal from Ben to use what FHIR has got with V2 mappings and make it extensible. Um, I personally think that's a quite a reasonable proposal because then it allows people to put other things if they want to. Yeah. Um, I, I'd, I'd agree with that, Manish. Although, just recognise, you know, that that's going to mean a bit of a, a bit of a muddle for a while. But we're in a bit of a muddle now, so we're not any worse off. Yeah. So yeah. I think that that covers all kind of the current scenario and and your concerns, Ian, that people won't be able to use other stuff. Um, and also, we can build on as we kind of go through iterations of these to uh, see how we develop this. Um, can, I, can I just jump in, Muni? Sorry, sorry, I know I'm interrupting. But David Cohn's question is a beautiful question. I was hoping somebody else would raise it. This is a tricky part. This, in some ways, is a tricky part where I think the boundary between what is in SNOMED within the core to what is outside gets a bit blurred. It would be worth talking for now. I don't think we need to discuss. <laughs> Unless, David, you can't hold yourself back and you want to explain what you're saying. I think that's the beautiful part where I think what goes in the fire message or an attribute in the fire message might also get duplicated in the the code itself. Just just flagging it up because that's a beautiful comment as far as I'm concerned. So just 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 to read uh, David Cohn's comment, everybody. Am I right in thinking that the UTC codes included representation of the type of specimen test was done on? I personally don't understand this. Um, cool. I can give an example on that one. So. Part of the UTC, as in UTL, is what we call unified test list, is a SNOMED subset of codes we are building that gets sent across the wire or actually gets included as part of the result. At the moment, if you look at the modeling of UTL, one of the aspects of what is modeled within that code of UTL is the specimen type on which it was actually done, which is really, really simple for things like serum plaza. Although I didn't realize specimen type can be a lot bigger than that. So what David is saying is, hey guys, actually for a whole bunch of things, we don't need to specifically tell people about the specimen and the container maybe because some of this might be also inferable from the code. I said might because you might still care about the fact that they were in the same specimen was sent but used in you know two different preservatives, for example, right? So this is, I think, the beautiful boundary where how much of information that is currently of need is within a code based off the specimen and how much of it is in the, in the FHIR model. Did that make sense to people who are listening? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense cool. to me, and I understand it better, thanks. So basically we're saying the, the SNOMED code itself, the test code itself, might have some information on specimen type. Um, and then again, this is a philosophical debate on how much of information model you carry in fire, how much you carry in snowmad. Right, okay. So, 
I think currently we, we will stick to the proposal which Ben has given and make it extensively um, unless anybody's got um, issues with the proposal. Um, so from from the work that you know there was there was extensive discussion you know kind of two two hour sessions at the, at Snowman on Fire around the, the terminology of binding and the model model of specimen and um, most you know there, there, there's quite a mix of things in, in in this list here you know so there's there's aspirate which is actually you know is actually a method rather than a than a substance and the conclusion in this in the snowman on fire discussions was that the, the specimen hierarchy which actually isn't part of substance or um, body size wasn't appropriate and what wasn't you know de decently mapped so you know and, and so I'm you know I'm I, I have I have reservations about about, about using this list it, it was it was looked at by you know um, by terminologists kind of look, looking in this area and, and, and kind of, you know, um, I, 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 I would hesitate to, to sort of back this, you know, back this proposal with, without, without, without looking at it in, in, in more detail um, and we can try and I'll, I'll distribute the um, link to the the snowman on fire site it, it's it's partially closed because it's part of the um, members forum but but people can go on that uh, I think we need to come back to this okay we'll, we'll look into it um, if we, we could we can put the link on the rival platform and uh, get some feedback well I think we've got a number of options now um, including the link you're going to send and Ben's proposal as well so okay any other comments? Okay, carry on. Uh, so then we have in this uh, iteration suggested a couple of extensions. So obviously the extension for approximately, which we talked about with Damien, uh, Damien's suggestion of maybe using an observation resource rather than a uh, an extension, which we will have a look at. Uh, I, Obviously, Ian's uh, comment about uh, you kind of just moving the problem around is also true, uh, but certainly something we can look at in more detail. Uh, the other extension that we were going to look at was one for fasting status, which is an extending to include a field that would uh, that will be available in uh, version four. So this is release four version of fire specimen, and uh, you can see here there's a fasting status didn't really exist previously and it was something that we thought we needed to represent anyway so at the moment that's uh, they're the only two extensions that we've considered uh, are there any questions about those you see we've discussed one of them so, so I think before. do you want to do you want to show the fasting status in release four okay yeah so that's the one we are proposing as extension in STU3 for a forward compatibility. Okay. We got Jonathan. Yeah, just a note there that a similar to that discussion about how much is done in Snowbed CT, uh, how much is done in fire on investi on identifying investigations. There's a similar issue for fasting status because I'm I'm not sure how that's been approached in the new list of investigations in Snowbed CT. I, is fasting blood glucose the name of an investigation or not? Okay, Jay. Okay, quick comment on that. I think it's the ability to be able to do something different with it. We are aware that there are fasting, you know, tests of some sort of various sort in Snowman CT. We have debated as to where the precondition, what, this is what we call a precondition, just for the record. So fast the patient, the fact that the patient is fasting is only a precondition. We don't believe it should necessarily change the meaning of a code, although it would change the interpretation of a code. And so by extension, 
we don't believe at the moment that it should be part of a code or a specific code. I I really, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm really conscious at the moment. I am making a controversial statement because there are a whole bunch of fasting codes that exist at the moment. So, so let us actually park this for now as one of those tricky problems between terminology models and information models. We know historically people have preferred to solve it the simpler way by sticking it into the terminology, right? And I think this would be the sort of question I would love to take to the international lab medicine community and say, guys, we now have two ways of doing it. Which one do you think works better? Does that answer some of your question, Jonathan? But then we uh, have a I, I, I like not having it in the name of the investigation, but it's uh, by far the majority practice is to have it in, as in fasting blood glucose. Agree. So that was a problem for a different time. Future systems shouldn't necessarily want to do it. If we choose not to do it, when we have a slightly different problem, which is how what do we do with all the historical data? And that's why I would love to take this to the April summit discussion and say, guys, we need to solve this properly. Can I add one thing very quickly? Go ahead, Laszlo. Sorry, I don't don't have the ability to put up my hand I'm on my phone. Uh, I think it's, uh, yes, uh, Jay is entirely right. We need to park it for a later sort of discussion. But I think this needs to be handled slightly differently because I still believe uh, that uh, the clinicians should request things very simply, like I want to have a fasting glucose period, but it shouldn't be part of the uh, sort of test uh, name or the test itself, I think it should be a, a separate condition. And that needs to be somehow sort of traversed, but it's probably not for now to discuss. Ben? Hi, um, I was just gonna say, and I understand the risk, the risk of if you put it into the, the, the requests in the terminology is um, as well as having it uh, passed out in the information model somewhere else. The risk is that they, the, the two could be inconsistent. Um, so in terms of having a choice of having one or the other, um, there could be inconsistencies in the, in the uh, knowing where to look. Um, I think one thing that could be explored would be to um, allow the values to be loaded in the request and the terminology, but also require them to be passed out into the information model. Um, so that you'd have that in so that so you'd be able to rely on looking at within the specimen type, for example. Um, but then you'd probably want to look at having kind of possibly looking at using fire paths to have uh, invariant rules in the element definition. So in saying, well, if if the uh, request is of this type, then you would expect the uh, specimen type to be one of these values or to be this value or um, just an idea about something that could be explored more. Hello. Yeah, ben, thanks, I think that's a great sorry. solution. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we'll take that on board, Ben. We'll, we'll discuss it internally. Um, how how to handle it? But as Jay said, this is going to be it's going to evolve in terms of um, as we kind of go through iterations. Any other comment on this? Ben, your hand is still up. Did you have any? Okay, thank you. Okay, Pete, do you want to move on? Um, yeah. Well, I think it's a uh, Phil will has some assumptions that we made some questions about. Are you going to? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Cheers, Bill. So the first one is um, around payment details. So there's a segment in the Edifat spec um, laboratory service order uh, segment four, I think it is, um, that carries a payment category field. Um, it's also labelled as uh, financial charges allocation. Um, and based on uh, some data analysis we've done, um, it, that particular data item doesn't seem to be populated. So I guess the question for the group is. You know, is is it used? Um, and, if, and presumably, if so, we will need to carry that forward into into fire. But it's really to get a wider wider set of views. Really, I don't know if you've got the um, Edifat spec to hand, Pete. Yeah, just get it up now. 
Yeah, so I think uh, the question for suppliers is, is there any use case for this? Is it really used? Do we need to worry about it? Um, or we can just drop it because it's a legacy thing and it's not used. Jonathan? Um, uh, I, I didn't want it in the national message uh, and Department of Health insisted on it being there. Um, I don't think it's widely used. But there is a related point that is not the extension, and that is the origin of the report is more complex, I think, than is being considered at the moment. Um, and that particularly relates to the reorganization of laboratories, uh, work between them, the joint venture operations in London. Uh, uh, so I, I wouldn't have it here, but I think there's something about where this report came from that's going to be quite important in the future. Okay, thank you. If anybody else has got any, uh, any views on it. Um... No, I don't think so, unless anybody else raises their hand. I think we're going to not include it. If you do want it to be included, it's you can come in now. Okay, move on. Okay, so the, the last bullet point in there um, relates to um, the ability to batch test results. So our understanding is this is uh, legacy behavior um, related to when um, the Edipat messages first went in, obviously back in the days of of dial-up uh, and the need to um, save costs. So our understanding is that it has an ability to um, group together a set of test results for different patients that can be sent as a batch. Um, and, as, and again, our understanding is that that was used uh, to send uh, groups of tests, um, say, uh, you know, when the telephone calls or uh, charges were cheapest. Um, I suppose the, the question is moving into the world of fire, is that behavior really required? Um, and our assumption, our understanding currently is no, but again, Put that to the group. Um, I don't see a particular value in this within the scope we're discussing. In yeah. areas like immunisation screening programmes, it's the standard way of doing it. Okay. So you're saying this should be included? I, with the, within this scope, I don't think that has particular value. But but if, for example, you're a microbiology report sending out vaccination reports, by far the most efficient way is to have them all saying, here's a set of vaccination reports, name, date, value. Yeah, so you shape it differently. But I don't see a big big need for it from what we're discussing. Okay, thank you. Okay, Damien? Why technically it's an issue in terms of carrying the information in fire structures and if it's convenient then I don't see it's a particular problem um, <clears throat> because within the information carried about any given uh, patient then all the references would point to uh, the various uh, resource instances for that patient and if there were other things there that um, belong to other patients then it wouldn't be a problem. Okay. So I don't know if anybody else got any comments on those, but if not. Okay. Uh, thanks. Just just reflecting on Jonathan's comment, I think I'm just wearing my, you know, between lost in translation hat on at the moment. I think Jonathan's comment was the scope of this project doesn't make sense. So maybe even for microbiology itself might not make sense. But if we then combine microbiology with immunization, maybe it does make sense to have or at least start thinking of this. I'm aware some of the previous work did come cover immunizations. I just wonder if this is one of those things that falls through a gap, and I'm just flagging that as a possible risk. I don't know where that would go at the moment. It certainly wouldn't go in the pathology program. It probably, I don't know if there's a generic risk register, but it just seems like something worth capturing. I think at the moment, the best thing would be, Jay, for you to capture that as a risk for you in your program and then hand yeah. over whoever okay. whoever wants it. Okay, yeah. cool. That's a good solution. Thanks. Okay. Phil, I will just leave that with you for now and we can pick this up again. Cheers. Yeah, we'll do Jay. Okay, Andrew Attack. Hello. Hi. Um where you're saying about um keeping it to one patient per message, we we can send out over five thousand GP results a day sometimes and we often have batches of 50 go out 50 patients go out in um, one message to a gp practice okay um which means you you're saying you do need the batching functionality it makes it easier because if there's problems and you're trying to trace what's happened to messages 
um, if you've got batches of them, it's far easier to trace the whole lot um, than it is to try, if you're tracking down individual patients, there could be so many messages that you're looking for. Yeah, that's a fair point. And especially when you're going on to things like moles to see what's going on. Okay, Jay. Hey guys, so sorry, I, I keep I keep wincing every time I hear these comments. Just because something needs to be done for a real life situation where you do need to batch, I don't think we're actually, you know, arguing against the ability or the need for having batching. I think that's fine, but to include it as part of a specification sounds really horrible to me as an engineering principle. So I would be really against it. What I would love to say is, if you're using a middleware, and I know I'm sorry, Andrew, I know you will kind of probably smile at me or kind of curse me, but if you are using a solution, a middleware solution, you probably want to investigate how your middleware solution can handle those batching, as instead of actually sticking it into the into the standard spec. Shoot me now if you disagree. By the way, <laughs> I won't take it the wrong way. Um, well, I, I was just looking at batching on, on in terms of. Um... We're, we're sending stuff out to 100, over 180 different GP practices, and I, I get quite a few queries every week from practices saying, oh, we haven't got this, or we haven't got that. And it's generally a problem that with their system supplier, well, with, with their system, and they have to get onto their supplier about it. But the ability to easily track the messages makes life so much easier when you're trying to do this fault finding and see where, where the where the fault is now, whether it's with our end or whether it's with their end or quite what it is. Okay, so I I got a few people coming in. Um, Damien, do you want to come in first? Um, yeah, it's also not actually necessarily a problem that the uh, pathology cur curation needs to consider itself as solving because the NHS uh, Digital Fire Policy Working Group has a paper that. Uh, I wrote along with, um, oh, what's her name, Katie Wheatley, um, about precisely this, about the distinction between various forms of uh, collective submissions of fire uh, resource sets, including batches and including transactional sets, which have to be handled atomically. So there is consideration of how to do that anyway available from other sources that uh, that could just be used in this case rather than being something for um, <clears throat> pathology itself to have to solve. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I think this brings on James' point that this is sending pattern and we hard coding this in profiles is not the best idea. We have to look at a generic approach of doing it and pathology can use it and as you said, that's being considered. And as a design principle, it doesn't say it seems like a good idea for us to hard code any kind of that requirement into any of the profiles. So from a curation perspective, I think we should keep it um, kind of uh, decoupled uh, and, and have that conversation how to handle that batching for fire in a generic way. Um, Mike. Okay. Uh, my being covered for what's just said, but I think the key thing here is we're not saying you can't batch these and send multiple uh, fire messages for multiple patients at the same time under the same wrapper, for instance. Uh, all it says is, all we're saying here is that in terms of what we're defining for a pathology message, it's a single self-contained message for one patient. But that you could send multiple under the same uh, wrapper system, depending on uh, the various technologies available. I don't think it prevents any of that. Oh, right, that's no problem then. That, that, that was my biggest concern. I thought you were saying, I thought we were saying we couldn't do that. But yeah, I think if we can send individual messages under one wrapper, then that's fine. Okay, um, Ian? Yeah, I just, I guess the principle is, look, we're, we're, we're definitely not saying don't do it. Um, we're not looking at it particularly. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to solve that problem. And what would be really helpful is those of you who expect to do that, have a look at what we're doing and tell us if there are any gotchas. We, we don't think there are, but you know that feedback at this point is it would be really, really helpful. Okay, Jonathan. 
Yep, I think it's the same point as Mike's. We're talking about two different things under batching. One was that efficiency about the messages and, and uh, how much you can put in. But the specific issue that I think is on the slide was the one I was referring to, which is to say, here come a whole lot of neonatal phenylketonuria results. Patient X negative, patient Y negative, patient Z negative, rather than the normal shape for a report, which goes patient and then investigations under that in the hierarchy. And it's that bit that I don't think is needed at the moment, not the efficiency argument. Okay. I think we will, based on the feedback, um, I think we will carry on our conversation um, with Damien on the guidance of what um, the request is coming um, from Andrew. And, and I think for, for, the, for the other layer of it in terms of immunizations and all, all that batching, I think as Jay's discussed, we have to look into future requirements. Right, okay, Is that, does that finish the batching discussion, I think? That's a summary, go ahead, Pete. Yeah, just to summarise then, um, we're still working through it and we're hoping to publish the alpha spec in, in March and there'll be a a link on the C3 uh, thread in, in RIVA. Uh, obviously, we're interested to hear from suppliers and that, that will be interested in being involved in first types. Um, and uh, I guess there's, you know, we've gone through a, a fair amount of detail there. Uh, if, if after the call you, you you remember something you want to let us know about, obviously use RIVA to to get back to us with further comments. So I think that's Yeah, so I think the principle it. is that the, the school is set up to really introduce um, the pathology discussion and also give you high level design options in some of the discussions we had. And you are welcome and encouraged to go to the driver platform and you know if you think about after this call that you have further questions or comments, carry on the conversation there. And we as core team will pick it up. Um, at this point, does anybody else have got any other questions? Jonathan, are you feeling a little bit better about the scope now? Um, uh, thanks for the question. I need to think about it. But the thing that would help me most is what we discussed, which is that very early discussion where I kept interrupting. If those framed this discussion in the slides in the documents, it would make it much easier to understand who's doing what. My concern then is not predominantly about what you're describing within this project, but that those wider needs are not being addressed anywhere. Okay. Um, Jay? Uh, yep, just a quick uh, quick come back to Jonathan. So, so Jonathan, you will have enough and more time to ask me all these questions during the informatics review that PRSP is holding. Okay. I'm sorry, Ash. again, please? So I'm saying you will have enough and more opportunities for, for to ask all these questions, the broader informatics questions, as part of the PRSP informatics review, and I will attend those calls. But I think what I really appreciated is your feedback is to say the message has to be much better coordinated and put out cleanly. Thanks, Jay. Okay, Ian. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask a question back, actually, and it's particularly about micro, obviously not not within the scope but since we've got a lot of knowledgeable people on here uh, you know at some point we are going to have to tackle microbiology you know there are definitely aspects of that that, that deserve to be coded and structured in a consistent way i just wanted to, to see if it's you know if there's any quick views on whether the the, the micro lab community are really in, in a mood for undertaking that level of standardization because it will have to come from within the community I, my feeling is we're just not there at the moment Okay, I'll let people think about it. I've got a hand up from TPP. Do you want to come in? I'm not sure it's a different topic. Um, just around the um, some of the mandatory fields um, in the specification, I think we've got to be very careful about you know stuff like you know, your fasting states and stuff. Um, legacy data. You know, there's, we've talked a lot here about, oh, you know, this comes from lab and goes through. There's lots of legacy data out there, you know, where from a bit previous migrations, be it manually added results, where you're not necessarily going to have specimens. You're not, you know, you, you've literally just got a group of, uh, of results. So I think we've just got to be very careful that we're not 
making fields mandatory where it literally does not exist in legacy data. Yeah, that's. I think that's the design principle we have anyway. We don't think mandate unless they are mandated in fire in the base resources. Um, um, and yeah, we are likely to mandate things as we move forward unless there is a real clear business need for a clinical safety issue. Yeah, I mean, should we, and we do need feedback from people on the ground who, who understand the realities of what's there so that if, they're, if we are faced with something that is mandatory in the underlying fire resource and that is going to cause the sort of difficulty that's been expressed, then, you know, it's up to us to, to provide some clear guidance. Yeah. And, uh, consistent guidance that gets us around that. But we, we need to have good examples. That's the, I think that's the biggest thing we can get at the moment is to understand where the, the real world problems are likely to, to come in. Yeah. So I think from our perspective, it will be helpful, Will and Chris, if, if you've got any specific examples, if you find, um, you know, where you think the mandation won't work or you can, you're welcome to, you know, look at our design position matrix and, and have yeah. a view and, and give us some feedback. Um, ben, yeah, I've given some feedback already. Okay, that's great. Ben? Hi. Um, there was just a couple of other points. Um, I added a couple of points to the chat channel. Um, one was just about um, ensuring, in terms of uh, uh, creating extensions for things that exist in R4, such as fasting state. Um, we should look at uh, creating standard uh, backports, uh, similar to what was discussed with uh, the proposed medication request status reason uh, extension. Um, I've just added a link to the Zulip channel about that. Um, and. The other point was just around the observation grouping um, that was discussed in terms of the different options. Um, I, I didn't, don't see those as necessarily being having to be mutually exclusive approaches. Um, it, really, it depends on um, so some things are going to be grouped at the diagnostic report level. Um, some things that may be appropriate to group at the component level where it wouldn't make sense for the observation to be looked at in isolation um, and other things may be appropriate to uh, groups by related observations um, and just put a link in there to the guidance on the observation resource about the, the distinction between those. Um, and then the final point was just about the point being made about the observation profile having gone through curation. Um, while I mean, it was it, there was a very um, limited scope in terms of the generic observation was really just looked at in terms of vital signs and it's only so far, so far been through uh, uh, clinical curation but there's been two stages to the curation so far in terms of clinical and then a technical review and it hasn't been through the technical review yet. That was all. Yeah, yeah, well, we're aware of that and I think we, we said we had to create an instance of care connect observations for doing vitals because we couldn't create the vitals or news to level three without having a level two instance. Um, but as the approach as Ian described is that the way we handle these things is that we only curate for things where we have use case and for the rest of the profile we don't delete anything, we leave it there and we curate as we go along. Um, and no, that, that all makes sense. It was just to clarify for others on the call that when we say that something's been through curation, it, it's been through a round of clinical review, but there was also a second round in terms of a technical review, which some of the profiles have been through, which the observation hasn't been through yet. No, it hasn't gone through formal technical review. Um, so, Ben, the other points you made um, in terms of observation pattern and design pattern we are proposing, I think we have looked into the observation guidance in quite a detail. And again, the pattern we're recommending we think is 80-20, it will meet, meet most scenarios. Um, in terms of the component pattern, we felt the, the, the guidance is so tight on component pattern for 
having you know same instrument same practitioner same time that in pathology results we couldn't find any use cases for it though blood pressure is a more of a vital not a pathology result um and i think if you do have use cases in which you think we will use alternative valdopaxins please kind of if you if you send us some use cases it'd be really helpful for us to look into it to so can I tell what are you proposing at the moment? You're proposing that we only do it based on related observations, that we don't group things according to diagnostic reports as uh, some things might be grouped and diagnostic, but not as related uh, observations. Yeah, I think exactly. I'm going to use a combination of the both. No, it's not an option of one or the other. It will be a combination of the two, maybe, with the component being less relevant to labs. Yeah, so that's, Munish, I was just going to come in and, and, and if I may, because I, I, yeah, I think that's exactly the answer. The, the, the problem is if we leave option one open, we're going to have what I think is probably quite a critical data point, which is the, the, the group name potentially in two different, quite different places in the fire structure. One is going to be in the diagnostic report and the other is in the observation um, code. And so I think there is that open question about the use of component. I don't think it will be required in labs, but there are some things like immunology where, you know, occasionally there are tightly coupled sub values. Um, they're probably okay a, to handle as a, as a flat battery or flat panel structure. Um, but, you know, I think, we, I think you're right there. We should leave that open, but I think we should plump for either using the diagnostic report for panels or the observation header, you know, re repurpose the observation for the panel name, for the group name. Otherwise, we're going to have a bit of chaos. It does look as if Fire version 4 is, is tending in, in the direction of using the observation uh, in the way that we're suggesting, rather than using diagnostic reports for panels. That, that was my reading of, of, of Fire 4. I, I guess for Panels, I think we could. it could be an either or um, thing, but there would still be groupings maybe of those panels within the diagnostic report to say these were all done to get as part of a, a set, no? Well, that's, that, I, I'd be reluctant to go down that road. I think we have, I, I would like to try to handle panels very consistently so the panel name is always in a consistent Resource. No, I, I agree with that. I agree with the panels. It's just that within a diagnostic report that you may have more than one panel conducted. Oh, yeah, that's, then, that's yeah, So they would be yeah. all grouped together within the diagnostic report. Yeah, we can do that. That's not a problem. So it's what the, the, okay, what's, that's you know, fine. the diagnostic report is effectively the top level structure for the, the document. Yep. And then everything else under that is going to be represented as observations. Okay, so that makes sense in terms of having a kind of mutually exclusive approach to uh, the, the panel. It, it, yeah. it is confusing when you look at these things because originally I think diagnostic report sort of equated to the OBR segment in HL7 V2, which is much more like the panel header, but it seems to have drifted up the document in terms of, you know, fire thinking and the, the representation of panels is now preferred to be in, in, in observations the way we've done it. Okay, Jay, did you have a comment? Yeah, just to say that that is exactly how I think we should actually articulate our implementation guidance. I would strongly recommend our team when they write the guidance to take these you, you know scenarios and say, here's how we would expect each of these scenarios to work out, and spe specifically panels being a really tricky subject. Diagnostic report would be the place where I think the meaning should be, and the rest of the individual pieces should be, the components should be observations. Okay. Right. So I think we're going to, um, thanks for the comments, Ben, and I think we'll feed that in our implementation guidance. Um, and, and we can handle multiple um, batteries that link to a diagnostic report, so that's not the um, issue. Um, so your question, yes, I think as part of the this meeting notes, the chat window comments will be included. So that's that's fine. Right, we've got five minutes left. Has anybody got any final comments, questions um, they would want to share before I close this call? Okay. If not, um, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we'll share the recordings and the notes and the presentation is already there. 
please uh, carry on conversation on driver and thread, which is the link you have there. And I hope you all have a good weekend. Bye now. Thanks, Munish. Thank you. Ah, thank you. I am Munish. Before you disappear, sorry. Hello. Uh, lots of lots of things going on. Hey. <laughs> Munish, can you?